Welcome to Zelda's Peaches and Biscuits podcast. I'm Elena Doten, the director of the Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald Museum, and I'm joined with Maura Martello, Zelda researcher, Zelda fan, and a, uh, I'm a docent at the uh, Fitzgerald Museum here in Montgomery. Uh, we should say that we are doing this podcast by phone, so if you hear a little fuzziness in our mics and whatnot, <laughs> we, we had to... Uh, we're unfortunately not in the sunny sunroom of the Fitzgerald House. Um, we also uh, we had a delay in our taping because we did we are in tornado thunderstorm season. Each of our last two Sunday nights have had pretty bad thunderstorms, so uh, we uh, we've lost power on occasion. Yes, yeah. and so thank you for your well wishes on the uh, Facebook page. Uh, we're hopefully. Back to recording, and today we're going to talk about uh, the Pleasant Avenue house, the, uh, Zelda's childhood home. Uh, we know that her family lived at various residences, but basically moved to uh, the Pleasant Avenue house when she was about 10 or 11 years old, and that's where they live really until her father dies in 1931, um, and this is where she's living when she meets Scott. Right, and yeah. uh, the first half of Save Me the Waltz, for instance, takes place at the Pleasant Avenue house. Yeah. So um, what we thought we would do is, is Mayfield has some really lovely and um, very detailed descriptions of what the house was like, interior, a uh, bit of the exterior. You can s you'll see on our uh, Instagram and again on our Facebook uh, group page. Uh, we will have uh, images. We have a really beautiful painting of the Pleasant Avenue House done by Patricia Nix, uh, and we will post those. Uh, but we thought we'd just go over these various descriptions of what it was like and, and what what that house meant to rereading Mayfield. It, it seemed to be the Pleasant Avenue home, as she calls it, was lost my place. The, like a mecca for, uh, for playmates. So it seems to be very had to have been very central to the neighborhood. Um, yes. And then at the end, I think that area is now very important to Montgomery, but we'll maybe talk about that toward the end. So do you want to start with the house description? Uh, the house description, okay. Uh, Zelda said it had an affinity for light in Save Me the Waltz. Uh, it was a, gray, a square gray frame house with green shutters. Uh, it was built in the early years of the 20th century. I think that I have read, some, uh, unfortunately, I don't know the source, 1901 may have been uh, the year that it was built. And it was distinguished by its freedom from the gingerbread work that was characteristics of older ha houses in, in that part of town. It was not a Victorian house. No, uh, and I think that's unfortunately, had it been more ornate, Kind of yes. like, like the Painted Sisters that we know about. You know, that term, I think, in a way, comes from the San Francisco houses. But there are a few here in Montgomery. I think had the house been more ornate, it might have been saved. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I'm sure that if it was a Victorian, either a Second Empire or just, you know, Queen Anne, uh, people would have been, uh, would have leaked to help. But it is... Uh, as we've said, uh, next door to where uh, Zelda's house was is a house that's very, very uh, similar in style. It's probably built by the same person, yeah, whoever the. I get yeah. the sense that and the it's, it's not it's not distinguished uh, no, architecture. But I I wonder if the the lack of gingerbread actually makes the house more modern. You know, we were talking about how that they're a bohemian family and that. You know, they were really a modern yeah. family. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting to note that even the house they lived in kind of had thrown off Victorian fashion as well. That's very. In that's a very good point. Very interesting. Yeah, that's in entirely possible. Uh, certainly, it also had uh, what I think, and you can still see remnants of it today, uh, a very deep, steep garden. Yeah, uh, the property is very deep. Um, I'm not sure when we, we, we went and for everyone before the, the quarantine, we went and kind of did a tour together of Montgomery and the various houses and, um, associated and, with Zelda. Yeah, yeah. We went, when we were walking around the, the neighborhood, we, we could see that someone had put in like a vegetable garden at the back. 
But yes. I don't know if there would have been, if the original garden was that deep, if there had been a house, you know, how houses would have been back to back. But mm-hmm. it seems like that lot was very deep. Um, Mayfield's description, uh, it seems to say that the large, that it, it did have a big backyard. Um, I think that's true. I'm, I'm rereading the front uh, sections of uh, Save Me the Waltz, which is very autobiographical. And she talks, they had actually, uh, they had hen houses uh, in the backyard. They yeah. had chickens uh, as well as gardens, and they were, they were growing uh, tomatoes in the back. And if you look at it today, you can see straight through to Virginia Street if you get it at a certain angle. It's between, it's off of Mildred uh, Pleasant Avenue, uh, Mildred Street, and it, the house, the yard uh, of the house shoots all the way through to is it Virginia, Virginia Avenue or Virginia Street? I'm not, I'm not sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's the next one west, I think. Yeah. yeah, and it really, I'm, I'm hoping one day that maybe we can have access to the actual backyard and, and maybe see if some of, something exists uh, from Zelda's time. Yeah, when you, when you go, uh, the house is just on the southern border of, or the lot where the, ho- where the house was, we should say, it's just on the southern border of the Equal Justice Memorial in Montgomery. Yes. And uh, it's an empty lot, but the stairs which led up to the house are still there. It is fenced, so you cannot walk around on the property. Yeah, uh, and I think a lot of people know there's photos of Scott and Zelda at the house in, what, 21, I think? 1921, uh, yes. So there's him um, sitting in a suit on the staircase, and then they'll, uh, in the backyard, so you can get, and then we will post these on the show notes, um, but you do get a sense of what that looked like. And I think the backyard, it, it just seemed like an open backyard, so it, it, mm-hmm. I don't think there's yeah. much change there, even though the house is gone. Yes, yes, I would agree with that. Yes, you can still st- see the staircase that Fitzgerald was photographed on. Uh, so... You know, with with a, a bit of imagination, you can really get a sense not only of the house but of the neighborhood that Zelda grew, grew up in. Uh, in Mayfield's description, it, she says uh, Miss Minnie had trained Virginia creepers and vines on wires to screen the porch from the western sun, and we think that uh, might have been a back porch, not the front porch, because the house would have faced east. Yes. Um, yep. And it says, in summer, at one end of the cool, shady gallery, as she called it, she entertained her callers, and the judge read the evening paper. And at the other end... Zelda used yeah. the creaking, the creaking swing, swing as a meeting place for her friends. Yeah. So they obviously had a front porch and a back porch, which is kind of typical of the area, <laughs> of these types of houses. Well, this is, I know this sounds strange, but just in terms of scholarship, I originally reading that thought maybe Mayfield, do we think they had two porches, or has Mayfield mistakenly called the front porch? Uh, the ba- do you know what I mean? I, I again, um, I'm only going by Save Me the Waltz again, where a uh, she and her mother uh, prepare um, a tomato salad on the back porch. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to assume there was a front porch and a back porch. Probably she met her suitors on the front porch, uh, and the back porch was probably more familial. Yeah. There's also the clip where uh, it says the neighbors complain that the Sarah girls bathe yeah. on the in the back. In the nude. In the in nude. The nude. Yeah, on the porch, yes. And I'm assuming that's the back. And then um, her mother I would, said, have, I would hope so, yeah. yeah. And then, and, well, her mother said, well, why shouldn't they? They have beautiful bodies. And that's one right. wonders, I mean, <laughs> even today, that's still pretty yeah. forward. Or I, I just want, because rereading um, Save Me the Waltz, it was, you know, or in Mayfield, too, is that, 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 the idea Minnie said that she had never seen her children do wrong. Yes. But as we talked about in a previous episode, the the, 
those first three girls and even Anthony were exemplary students, I mean, valedictorians. Uh, it's, yeah. it's Zelda that's really... Um, the outlier? Yeah, in terms of scholarship, but I wonder if they were all... Um, I don't, I don't know the word I'm looking for. They, they clearly were very good students, but I wonder if they were eccentric, but because they were so well behaved, you know, or so high achievers. A lot was forgiven. Yeah, and then Zelda didn't do as well in school, but, you know, it, yeah. by then it, it didn't really matter. Yeah. Well, the 20th century had taken hold by then, you know, maybe some of those Victorian... Uh, 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 virtues had yeah, that kind of more yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so turning to the the description of the interior it says both halls uh, that there well there were five bedrooms and it said uh, there were five bedrooms upstairs they're comfortable and cheerful and that Zelda's was the smallest and that downstairs it says both halls were lined with glass doored bookcases filled with encyclopedias it says in the library there were even more books, a piano, a Victrola, and a large collection of records. Um, it says the living room was furnished with inherited pieces of rosewood and mahogany. Among them were Daniel Sayre's marble top table and Senator Matchin's carved secretary. Now, at the Fitzgerald Museum, we have two marble top side tables and a banister which were saved from the Pleasant Avenue house. If that's the one that they're referring, to, if she's referring to here, or um, sounds very typical. It sounds it sounds like it would be no. Yeah, and then it says Senator Magin's carved secretary. We know that that secretary is now at the first White House of the Confederacy here in Montgomery. Right, uh, downtown. Yeah, downtown. Um, and, and Mayfield gives a, a very elaborate description of how during the Civil War, the, how the Matchin family home had been fired upon by gunboats uh, and that shrapnel had hit it. And you go, if you go to the first White House, you can see it. Uh, ask, they'll show it to you, but you can see where someone repaired it. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's an extremely large, extremely ornate piece of Victoriana. Uh, it's gigantic, actually. And I'm maybe I'm speaking out of school here, but somebody repaired it. Not somebody at the museum, but it was some, somewhere in between when it left uh, the Pleasant Avenue home or or the Sayre Street home, uh, which was Zelda's later home in the 40s. Uh, some somebody repaired the well, Scotty uh, somehow. Traffic. Okay. Scotty is the one who donated it to the first White House. Um, mo she knew that she had cancer and was dying, and the house that's now the you know we as known as the Fitzgerald home was still privately held. It didn't come up for sale until the year after her death. So mm -hmm. she donated that, and we know that there's also a couch and an armchair and possibly a table. I'll post them on the show notes that she had, that she donated to the first White House. And again, the reason that she donated them to the first White House is that house was built by Zelda's great uncle, uh, Daniel, um, there's William Sayre. Sorry, William right. Sayre. And that uh, he uh, had sold the house, uh, had moved to Mobile, and was very instrumental, one, in establishing Montgomery, but then working to build the railway from Mobile to Montgomery. That house then, after the fact, was then rented to Jefferson Davis and was saved. So that was originally a Sayre family home, and so she was basically giving the Sayre family furniture back to the Sayre, what was originally the Sayre home. So it, sorry, Go I'm ahead. sorry. Okay. Uh, so it may uh, have been in her home on Gilmer Avenue. Uh, Scotty lived over in the gardens, uh, Garden District um, section, Gil Gilmer Avenue. Or she had it in storage, one or the other. I, I think she must have had it. Um, I've heard the, the reason <laughs> that I went over to the first White House was because uh, various people had told me that knew Scotty, that she had the furniture and that she had given it to them. Mm -hmm. And then when I went over there, they, they confirmed, yes, that it had been donated by Scotty to them. So, right. Um, I know that she was a member of like the Daughters 
of the revolution, but I do not believe that she was a daughter of the Confederacy. I know she was a member of the DAR, but not the, yeah. Yeah. of the Confederacy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sure she was eligible because her family on both sides, I believe, were. Yeah, but, but I, I, I know... It, in my, it may not have been of her interest to her. No, but I, I know that she was fairly active in the... For example, a year ago, we hosted the... I forget, the one of the chapters of the DAR because Scott Fitzgerald um, is a descendant of Francis Scott Key. They held their meeting there because, you know, there's a historical component to some of their meetings. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, anyway, I know she was very active with the DAR. Yeah. Well, she was very much into geneo uh, genealogy as yes, well. Yes, both she and Rosalind were, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so going back, I wanted to talk about a couple other things. There is, it said, in the living room, there was, was a mezzotent of Napoleon uh, bidding farewell, uh, which hung in the living room, and that there was an oil portrait of Minnie's mother. The uh, mezzotint of Napoleon, I think, is a very famous print. Well, it was, of course, probably a painting first by Fontainebleau, but a lot of people have that mezzotint. It was also a very popular postcard. Again, we'll have that on the show page. But I wonder what the interest, I've always wondered what the interest in that generation was for Napoleon. I, you know, he seems very popular amongst American even British. I mean, the British defeat him, obviously, Waterloo. But uh, well, you me, see in that time period a lot of uh, devotion or a lot of imagery devoted to Napoleon. Well, yes, and of course everybody in the 19th century when photography became popular, men always posed with their hand in their, in their vest, uh, imitating Napoleon, of course. Yeah, but it, I don't know. I, I've always just wondered because he's kind of a, I don't know if he's a tragic hero or a failed hero. I well, always found him a very interesting figure, but it, it just mm -hmm. seems interesting that in the South that you would have... Well, maybe a gallant loser, right? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, amongst my great-grandparents, items that we have is our portraits of uh, Napoleon and, and, and Josephine, you know, these small portraits. And they're oh, about that same Victorian time period, and you just think, why? I, I don't know. I, I, yeah, no, it's very interesting. I, I would like to investigate this further. Yeah, well, uh, mezzotint. Uh, I don't really know exactly what a mezzotint is. A mezzotint, do you, do you know? I think what she's referring to is a lot. There were lithographs that were. Um, so during it's 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 pre photographic processing you would have a lithograph or an etching, and it would be printed, and then it mm -hmm. would be hand-tinted. I see. And so it may not have, in, in other words, it may not have been purchased by either the judge or many, many Sayer. It may have been handed down from one of their family members? Probably. I'll, I'll, I'll investigate it a little bit. In terms of mezzotint, what I think it was, was during the time period, if you went to a major exhibition, they would have copies of the, the master works. Uh, so again, they, they would have been redrawn as a lithograph and then tinted, and, and or you, you would buy it. Uh, we haven't really gone over it yet, but I know during Zelda's childhood at the museum, people would bring their copies of paintings or these kind of mezzotints for um, display because you couldn't, you know, you'd have, you couldn't travel to France or Spain to see the originals. So I right. think these are like early, you know, fine art prints uh, mm -hmm. at the time. So the fact that they have it, I think, is in part telling. Uh, and I, I think that this is almost undoubtedly the Fontainebleau painting. It's a fairly famous painting. It's, mm -hmm. it's not like the Davids, but it's a later uh, painting, probably from the Victorian era. Uh, so turning to Zelda's bedroom, uh, again, it says there were five bedrooms upstairs, that Zelda's was the smallest in the house, but had the finest view. So I'm assuming, uh, I, I, somewhere else it says that it was above, you know, it was in the front of the house, so it must have looked down yeah. over the front of the house. Yes. Um, Be sure about that. Uh, so it, I guess it would have looked across the street. 
she talks about uh, there was a pear orchard across the street. And that gets us back to this whole Wilson plantation uh, that, I, that is associated with that area. Yeah, the Wilson plantation is gone. I yeah. only st- I I don't know that much about it, but it must have been the that back end. Yeah. yeah. Is that what you think? I think you know, because I think yeah. the Wilson plantation if I'm correct, um I didn't think to to research this before. I think mm-hmm. it was it faced Mildred Street and it's where that big empty lot is on the corner yes. of Mildred yes. and so it must have the back of it must have been the orchard, like there, there her her six her house must have faced the side of it. So they probably were looking at the back side of the Wilson plantation. Yeah, that is what I have assumed when I've driven in the area. Uh, it, it to be further researched. <laughs> yeah. Now it's, I know that it was torn down, uh, I'm not sure when, I think a lot of that became derelict in the 60s, 70s, and I think when they knew that they were, you, you see this all across the, the nation, when they knew that they were going to put interstates through as many as 10, 15 years, you know, mm-hmm. you see it, they begin to clear and condemn and you know they they try to pick the swath of town where they can easily buy property or you know clear yeah. homes and i think yeah. unfortunately that was just that area mm-hmm. and then they begin to tear they, they tore down things um and condemned it so that they could buy land cheap and i think that's what happened to pleasant avenue as well no, I agree with that. Uh, yeah. Of course, in, in in Milford's book, Zelda, uh, you know, they talk. They uh, she she mentions that the neighborhood may have been changing as late as the 1940s because of the housing crunch after the war, uh, and houses were being broken up into boarding houses, and I guess uh, home prices were falling. I'm not sure. Uh, I know she quotes Minnie sitting on the front porch. This isn't on Sayre Street, which is in the neighbor, which is in the neighborhood. It's not far, yeah. Right, uh, saying that bottom rail was getting on top, meaning that uh, less. Uh, how can I put this? Uh, you know, poorer people were moving into uh, better neighborhoods. Yeah, I think in post-war, I think my grandparents, my grandmother's from Montgomery, my granddad was stationed in Montgomery they meet they marry and it's called well the West End would have been on the opposite side of the Alabama River but not that far it's near where Maxwell Field is today Mm -hmm. and so Montgomery to this day just keeps moving east Mm -hmm. uh, because south of town there's what we call gumbo soils you can't really move that way and so you you kind of see it even still is that the next generation kind of just keeps building these bigger or you know newer neighborhoods yeah. east and yeah. the town just still keeps creeping east and then even though you have these you know beautiful prominent homes people kind of leave them or their parents live there but now they live further out and it's uh, absolutely and true yeah the and city then, just keeps moving further and further east uh i I always think I live in downtown, even though they say where I live is, mi- is, is Middletown. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever come to Montgomery and you start downtown and then you just start driving east, you can almost see decade by decade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, yes. you can see it. And I think that in the 40s, what happened is a lot of the, the men stationed there, um, you know, you do like even the Pleasant Avenue house was subdivided into apartments. We know from the newspaper articles that it was subdivided. So you have these very large homes, and then even eventually the Felder Avenue house, um, yeah, it, it was subdivided. The year, uh, well, the act- well, the the Fitzgeralds lived there thirty one to thirty two. It subdivided in thirty three, and then reopened in thirty four as apartments. Uh, as, as part of the depression, so you have these very stately homes. I mean, a five-bedroom, and this is a really large homes. Um, and then, yeah. even even the Felder house, the we you know when it's the four apartments, <laughs> it's still a really nice two-bedroom, kitchen, bath, large living room, dining room, sun porch. I mean, not an insignificant apartment. 
Um, it's actually quite beautiful, particularly when you go upstairs and see the uh, the housing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just and beautiful. even the apartments across the street from the Fitzgerald Museum. Mm -hmm. One of those apartments is what twelve hundred square feet. I mean, there's an is apartment. That right? Yeah, it's the size of a you know small home. So. Um, so in the post-war era, I think the neighborhood did begin to subdivide because people, and I think the other thing that people don't really realize is that a house built in 1905 versus a house built in 1930, I mean, those are, you're running water, electricity, air conditioning, we kind of alluded to in an earlier episode, is that in some ways it's easier to build a modern house even in the 50s and 60s, and it is to retrofit these older homes. When you talk about retrofitting these homes, you have a house from 1900. If you just look at the Pleasant Avenue house, it may or may not have had um, running water. We know, I think it's from an earlier home. They talk about how many uh, had some important guests come to the house, and in a rush, I guess, uh, Tony, who was very young, put the lines the chamber pots along the front door and the guest comes and they're all I think it's like the governor's <laughs> wife is coming. Uh I'm sorry, I don't know the I forget the details. But yep. it, you get the sense that they still had chamber pots. So to retro yeah. so to retrofit some of these homes, you know, with electricity, running water uh, air conditioning is just might as well just move east is what you're saying well and build, it's just and build a home uh, yeah it, it's just easier home. and cheaper to build a modern home um, I know. will say I, I if I can interject sure. a second I would say that uh, Cottage Hill though uh, which is the na Zelda's neighborhood is coming back I'm very oh, yeah. pleased to see that there's a organization for instance you can pa I pass it uh, in the car often you know they're uh, there's a, a community there that wants to bring the homes back and they are they are beautiful homes but like we went uh, on our, our tour around the neighborhood to Winter Place and to see the renovation that they're doing on it is, is kind of astounding yeah. um, and it's almost like a skeleton and they're going to have to they're effectively rebuilding um, the interior yes. yeah particularly the second the, sec the, the first, there's, if you don't, most people know, Winter, winter Place is two homes uh, that are joined. It was very, it's, it's kind of locally known for having this underground tunnel uh, and the various uses of that tunnel from like the Civil War um, yeah. and then other, you know, reasons. Uh, and in the one house, you can see, I think they said it was going to be a residence. In the other house, it was literally just a skeleton kind of being held up that I think may eventually become like an Airbnb or whatnot. But just the amount of money that it takes to restore one of those, I mean, it would just be easier. <laughs> Absolutely. Which, Absolutely. Which is, I mean, it always comes down to the question of historic preservation. Can you save the house? Yeah, and in fact, didn't they lose part of the? They, of course, they have a uh, the kitchen in, at, at Winter Place is separate as yeah, as almost was. all it's older homes. The original kitchens were were never they were separate structures because the prevalence of fire. So yeah. if your kitchen caught fire, your house didn't. And when we were there, to, uh, there uh, one of the kitchens out back had collapsed. I think. Yeah, it was a brick. It was a brick uh, exterior, and it just had fallen, <laughs> fallen over. Uh, when I was there, uh, I took a, a ride there this week, and uh, we did have some high winds, and uh, there was a, a huge uh, tree branch down in front of Winter Winter Place. Luckily, it had not touched the house, which really is starting to look better than it has in in the two years I've been here now. Um, and it's associated with Zelda, of course. Uh, you know, there's a there's a uh, incorrect theory I have <laughs> that uh, Zelda met Scott there. I don't think that. Yeah, should. At that I think was uh, locally uh, Winter Thornton, who's I think the last owner from the the Winter Thornton family. He lived there, and he's known as uh, as quite a character and. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a documentary, I think, that was on PBS in the 90s where he says that they met there 
Uh, however, other people in Montgomery say, no, that's just something that Winter made up. So <laughs> <laughs> this is where you have these local stories that may or may not be true, but you, you really it's a you really have to kind of suss it out to find out yeah. is this um, a local truth, a local story, or a local um, yeah you know, tale. And uh, th that's that's it's very hard to separate truth from fiction uh, here uh, with Zelda's story, as we're finding out. You know, we have and believe me, we've we've yeah. found some some real truths that have gotten lost in the mix. You know. So, turning to her bedroom now, it says that she had a large wardrobe, uh, muslin curtains, a bed painted white with a Marseille counterplane, um, rag rugs covering Japanese matting, a slat-backed rocker, a small desk, and a pink floral wallpaper. Sounds and pretty nice. Sounds great. Yeah, Sounds beautiful. Uh, the thing that kind of stuck out to me was the Japanese matting because Japanese matting um, one I, I didn't expect to see it there Japanese matting comes from in the late Victoria we all know the Crystal Palace uh, exhibition and the Japanese this is part of my my graduate research you have these international exhibitions and this is really how Japan is introduced to the world and most people don't know but the influence of Japanese woodblock prints, Japanese decorative arts has a massive influence on modern art. Uh, people, Van Gogh, Picasso, uh, Monet had a collection of prints, but I didn't expect to see it here because Japanese matting was kind of considered, again, very modern. It's part of um, that, that, that idea of uh, what we call Japanism or, you know, like Chinosuri, Chinese influence. Um, but I, if people look at uh, Whist the painting of Whistler's mother, Whistler was also very influenced by Japanese art, it, more subtly so than, say, Van Gogh or, or you know, some of the Impressionists. But in, in that painting, most people, it's Whistler's mother in profile, and there's like a black drape in the background. That black drape is actually a Japanese kimono, but the flooring is Japanese matting. Mm -hmm. um, you can just see the lines. So, um, but yeah, I think most people. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. I think most people reading this would probably think that it's simply something that you put under a rug so it stops the slipping. No, it's not. The Japanese matting is what now tatami mats. You know, it it was the reed. I looked it up in the newspapers to see. Uh, and there's and I'll, it'll be on our show pages again. You actually see. Um, you know, the characterization of an Asian man sitting there. But these mats were woven. They have a really beautiful smell to them. I, I lived in Japan, studied in Japan. Um, and I, I think they there are a floor covering. You bought it by the yard, and you could see that they would be fit to your floor. So in a way it was, but, but they were woven in certain patterns. When you look at the matting, and, and I did look in the newspaper articles that the matting is colored. They have different patterns. Oh. Um, and Japanese matting has a really beautiful kind of um, almost like a, a night, you know, it's grass basically, but a nice, a nice light smell to it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think it's an indication, one, that they, it, it wasn't exactly inexpensive either. Uh, you bought it at like 25 cents a yard. It'd be, it's kind of early carpeting, like we, how we would have carpet now. Um, and it, it was actually installed. It wasn't just something you just threw on the floor. Um, yeah. So to see that detail, um, I was very surprised very that, that you would, yeah. and that, in looking in the newspaper, um, it's again the Tennille company. The Tennilles, uh, again, own the, what would be, what is now the Fitzgerald home at this time. Um, that, that you see that in Montgomery. I, I would have thought that would only been in more metropolitan areas because it was, but I was pleasantly surprised to see that they had Japanese matting. And when you think about Zelda's love of flowers, gardening, kind of aromatic experience, yeah. that the house would have had this very, I miss, that's one of the things in Japan, I, I you know, the tatami mat, um, 
that it has this really lovely smell to it. Uh, so it almost is like a faint floral smell that you have in your room. So it makes your, your living space almost like a garden. So you get the sense that, the, that even the house, you know, the, the amount of gardening and flowers and her love of flowers, you can see it even at this early age. It has this really lovely, I don't know, uh, smell in the room because of the matting. And you make it sound wonderful. I yeah. I really miss it because, you know. <laughs> I'm going out now and buy some Japanese matting. Well, when you, the, the, the thing about Japan that you, that I miss is that the traditional Japanese home, it goes for, you step on a stone. There's almost always a stone. You step into the house, which is wood. And then you step on the wood into the matting, which is basically a woven grass. And that, that there's this kind of textural feeling and transition that you, you have and that when you walk on it, it's very soft and it, it, it's just lovely. But mm. to know that they had Japanese matting in the house, yeah, it was just Well, nice. Zelda's bedroom sounds yeah. amazing. Um, Obviously, she, I don't know if you would agree with this, uh, but uh, she, she may very have well have been the family pet, you know, just this adorable young blonde child and they, you know, they just, turned her bedroom into a fairyland, a garden, an, out, an inside garden. I would think, but let, let's let's go to Save Me the Waltz, Zelda's description of, um, it's Dixie, which is Rosalind's bedroom, mm -hmm. and her bedroom seems like a wonderland to Zelda. Yes, or that's to, true. Or to the character Alabama, which is Zelda. Yes. So Dixie's bedroom uh, she says, Dixie was a very satisfactory person to her younger sister. Her room was full of possessions. Silk things lay about. And then she goes on, uh, and this is in Save Me the Waltz. So in Dixie's room, it says, Dixie was a very satisfactory person to her young sister. Her room was full of possessions. Silk things lay about. And then she goes on to list all the things in Dixie's room. And Dixie's room sounds very nice as well. Um, yes, yeah. it absolutely does. Uh, I mean, I, do you have it there? I yeah. mean, just, it's it says, wonderful. It says, silk things lay about, a statuette of the three monkeys on the mantel held, hit, held matches for smoking. So I'm assuming that's the see no evil, hear no evil, right. uh, say no evil monkeys. Um, she then lists... Uh, a uh, number of books we'll go over in a minute. And then it says, over the books, uh, a Gibson girl with a hat pin poked at a man through a magnifying glass. And again, we'll, we'll have this on the show pages, but it's three women who are very large, and it's this very tiny man, and they're inspecting him with like a magnifying glass and sticking a hat pin at him. And I think this is just a very evocative image of what it must have been like to be the the Stair sisters, mm -hmm. that there are these looming figures over and that can just inspect or poke it at men at will. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that I don't know if they, if they, I mean, this isn't Save Me the Walt, so I don't know if this is something that they actually had or if Zelda um, has put it in there, but it, 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 it even says in the novel that uh, in Save Me the Waltz that Dixie was about to turn 25, that Joan was 23, and that Alabama would be turning 14. The thing I think that the biographies seem to miss is that Rosalind, when Zelda was in high school, Rosalind was married, but that her husband was at war, and that she had moved back in. And then according to this, um, we know that she's 14 or so when uh, Clotilde marries. So that you have these kind of very strong presence of both Rosalind and Clotilde in the house, which you kind of see as uh, Dixie and Joan. And that I think they have a very strong influence on Zelda, which you don't really get the sense from the biography. No, I, not at all. And I think it's important that we bring this out because obviously these these women had tremendous effect on uh, Zelda's life and her outlook on life, uh, her interest in art and literature. It all came from Minnie and uh, uh, Tootsie and uh, Clotilde and uh, Marjorie. Marjorie. 
So in Save Me the Waltz, um, Zelda lists several books that Dixie has, and I think that they're very instructive because... Or I, I think the readers, she assumed that the readers of Save Me the Waltz would know the, the, know these books. And I, I knew some, but not all. And one is The Dark Flower by John Galsworthy, which is about, it says, an emotionally gripping tale focused on the intertwined fates of four women, each of whom is facing a critical juncture in her life. And I guess this really does describe, you know, the Sarah sisters. They're all young women, I guess Marjorie had married, in the novel, neither neither um, Dixie, Alabama, or Joan had married. Yes. Um, the next is The House of Pomegranates uh, by Oscar Wilde. Um, These are short stories, short yeah. fairy tales. Yeah, and but the thing is, is that Wilde had said that they were, one, not intended for children. So Oscar Wilde... We forget yeah. he had been arrested for uh, being gay or homosexual. That Wilde was, I don't know, oh, risque. He was, he was a very risque author. Or oh, he was anathema. Yes. So, uh, and if you if you know Eugene O'Neill's works, uh, particularly the play Ah Wilderness, uh, when his family finds out that he's reading Oscar Wilde, uh, he's reading uh, the Ballad of uh, uh, Reading uh, Jail. Uh, the, the main character, the parents are absolutely appalled. Uh, this man, you know, and especially, you know, America was still very puritanical at this period. Um, so that is quite shocking, actually, when you think that they had uh, Oscar Wilde in their home. Not only that, but, but, but particularly, you know, it's not like the portrait of Dorian Gray, which is kind of a cautionary tale, but you have these kind of semi-risque, I guess, uh, quote-unquote, short fairy tales. Uh, yeah, well... <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> you know, he always, he always gets away with murder uh, yes. after a while before yeah. he, you know, repents at the end of the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the next is The Light That Failed Me. And when I look this up, because I didn't know this Kipling, um, it's Rudyard Kipling, but it says, uh, the synopsis I found says, it follows the life of Dick Helder, an artist and painter who goes blind and his unrequited love for his childhood playmate, Maisie. Uh, it's Kipling's first novel when he was, when he was 26 year old in a semi-autobiographical uh, being based upon his own requited love for Florence Garrard. And this to me, if you, if you consider when Zelda Wright saved me the waltz, that God is writing Tender as the Night. You know, it, I, and it's not a direct parallel, but you have a Dick Driver. You have he's changed him from an author to a painter. You consider that Zelda was kind of shifting from writing to painting. Um, I just found it very interesting that she included this book because of the potential parallels to her own story. But also, she she knows that Scott's been working on Tender as the Night as well. And I just wonder if there's any correlation between those two. Hmm. I mean, I, I haven't read it, but when I first read it, it, it really jumped out to me. There was a famous film of it in the 1930s with Ro uh, Ronald Coleman. Uh, I don't know if people remember uh, Ronald Coleman, but he was a very, very famous uh, British actor uh, in the 30s and 40s. Uh, I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, I, I looked at I don't think, I think the movie came out after Tender is the Night, so I don't know if it would have been something. Because the Fitzgeralds, both of them, I mean, we know from transcripts, Scott says, you know, uh, that he, ke he kept files of stories, potential material or for ideas. Yeah. Um, so the next is uh, Cyrano de Bergerac, which is, of course, a ver very famous love story about possibly unrequited love. Uh, it's not, but it, it, it is. It's, it's, you know, that fear of rejection. So yeah. again, we, and then she again <laughs> says the illustrated Rubiotat between two plaster thinkers. So again, we have the, the Rubiotat of Omar Khayyam. Uh, if you don't know, it, it is a lyric <laughs> poem. I looked up just to see what a basic synopsis of it would be and it says rather telling a story with characters a lyric poem presents the deep feelings and emotions of the poet 
on subjects such as life, death, love, and, and religion, and it was first published in March of 1859. And evidently, this book was very much loved by the Sayre family. I mean, it's mentioned here. Again, we have uh, Anthony's it's, copy at the museum, but we know that Scott hated that she loved this. Well, it was very, very popular in the early 20th century. Uh, you know, if you see a, a play version, let's say, of The Music Man, um, the famous musical uh, that's set in Iowa, uh, Iowa, I think it is, the main characters are all reading it, and it's considered a dirty book. <laughs> yeah. So... It's not. It's not. It's, it's sentimental poetry, really, and I can see why Scott... You know, Scott was a snob when it came to literature. I can see him putting it down. Well, talking about a dirty book, the last one is the Decameron. And in the description Ooh, of Save no. Me the Waltz, it says, Alabama knew the Decameron was hid in the top bureau drawer. She had read the rough passages. And also, <laughs> <laughs> so the Decameron was also known for having you know, all these nude erotics, and we would not consider them, but they were kind of Victorian erotica, or they called gentleman's relish. You know, they had these nude lithographs in them. Uh, and, and I even went online just to see uh, if, if we could figure out which one she might have had. And, and looking at them, they'll show you the illustrations. And there are, they're, they're in some questionable poses as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the description of it, I thought, was also interesting because it is it's kind of harkens back, and I'd never put this to, to, together before, but it is about the Black Death. Uh, it's yep. written by Giovanni, Giovanni uh, Boccaccio. Boccaccio, an Italian yep. scholar of the 14th century. At the time the Decameron was written, the Black Death was wiping out the Italian population, so the backdrop of the story is how seven women and three men escaped the plague to create a community of equality and prosperity. Yeah. But, yeah. So, yeah, the school children always read it for the dirty bits. Yes. <laughs> so when you look at these stories in total, you have... Um, Two or three that are on the edge of, you know, they're very risque. You do have Cyrano de Bergerac, which is, is really a love story. And then you have the Dark Flower, which is about these women, you know, the fates of these four women that are intertwined. I think it gives a very interesting look again of Zelda's, what, what was important to Zelda, because she obviously chooses these for Save Me the Waltz, but that she ascribes them to Rosalind, and that, mm -hmm. or she ascribes to Dixie, who's the Rosalind character, and how forward, I think Rosalind really is the trailblazer and of, of the family. Um, as we found out, Clotilde was, was far more formal. Um, Marjorie was in Montgomery, was a school teacher, I think far more traditional. But I think the, and, and I will probably say it again and again and again, but that Zelda's confidence is something that she probably gets from her mother and from Rosalind. I think we should probably do a whole, a whole episode on, on Rosalind, is that Zelda grew up thinking that that was probably just normal, where Minnie and Rosalind are the real trailblazers in Montgomery. Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree with that. I think uh, Dixie was, in, in, to some degree, her role model in life. Uh, also, uh, not to be forgotten, uh, we glossed over it a little bit, is that uh, she's got cigarettes in her room. Now, today, well, today, of course, there's health concerns about cigarettes, so they, people slap them out of your hand. But in those days, that was considered, you know, kind of, kind of loose to be smoking cigarettes, a, a woman. Um, and yet, Dixie's got her, she's got her smokes. She also has um, a pair of electric curling irons. Yes. Which I su surprised <laughs> me. I know they have curling irons. There's obviously that very famous scene in, in Little Women where they, they burn, um, I forget whose hair they burn. It's like a lock of hair is burned off. I don't yeah. think it's Amy. But yeah. um, so that you, they did have curling irons, but the fact that they had electric curling irons, I don't know. Again, this is written in the 30s, about the 1910s. But you know, she has these curling irons. 
The other thing, and we, we haven't covered it, and I think we really probably should do a whole episode on Rosalind, that during the time that she is living at home, she organizes various um, relief efforts uh, for the troops overseas. One in particular is to raise money for smokes, to send, to send mm -hmm. cigarettes. Soldiers, to, yeah. Yeah, two soldiers, because, again, her husband was uh, Captain Smith at that point, later he becomes major, but that he's leading, I believe, an artillery company in the Argonne. So, I mean, the brutal battle was gas, and so one, one of her major fundraising efforts was for smokes. Yeah, yeah. it's a relaxant. Yeah. And the nicotine is a relaxant, and that's why the soldiers, uh, and may still be given to them today, to this very day, I'm not sure. Go ahead. Did we want to talk just briefly about uh, what happened to... Uh, yes, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is to as we close, um, talk about what we know about how, well, the how, why the house was torn down and I guess to close out what the neighborhood's like. Yes. Um, I have I have a, a, a little paragraph here. I don't know if you want me to read it from... Uh, yeah, Scotty. It's, you, it's Scotty, the daughter of, which is uh, the life of Frances Scott Fitzgerald Lanahan Smith by her daughter, Eleanor Lanahan. Of course, that's Zelda's daughter. Uh, and of course, Scotty tried to save the house. Uh, what happened is uh, the Landmarks Foundation uh, kind of rejected the idea. They weren't interested. I guess, I guess whatever, uh, it didn't f f fall into their bailiwick. Uh, so Do you she know wrote about a, what year she tried to save it? Does it say? This would have been seventies. Uh, the chapter reads nineteen seventy three to nineteen seventy six. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's we're talking the mid seventies, okay. I guess. Uh, and sh uh, let's see. So she writes. This is uh, Scotty Fitzgerald writes. We are tearing down the old house where your great grandfather Judge Sayre lived, and where my father met my mother, and using the columns and the old brick for the porch of this house. I am going to have a miniature made out of the original materials and give it to the museum. Uh, I guess that's the Fitzgerald Museum, or I'm not sure. No, there was the Fitzgerald Museum. No, there it was. No. Of course, that didn't come until the 80s. Yeah, you're right. It must be uh, maybe the White House. I think better. it's Landmarks, maybe. Oh, it's okay. It's because Landmarks owns the um, old Alabama town kind of open-air museum. Right. Okay, anyway, she goes on to say... <clears throat> I do wish the house could be saved as people constantly ask me about it, but it, as it has no architectural value whatever, it was built about 1900, it doesn't come under the Landmarks Foundation's sphere of interest, and I'm not about to spend $30,000 or so restoring it when it's in the worst slum neighborhood in town. So that's, that's that. Yeah, so. I think... Like we were saying at the top, I didn't realize that she would mentioned that it, you know, it had no architectural value. I guess that that conjecture was right. That the fact that it wasn't one of the gingerbreads, it's not one of the very pretty Victorian houses. Yeah. That it yeah. was um, somewhat plain, you know, mm -hmm. was a, a deciding factor. And I can imagine in the like we were saying in the 70s, um, you know, everyone had really begun to move. Montgomery really began to expand. I, if we ever do a tour, you, it, it's very interesting because you, as you drive from downtown um, on Madison Avenue, which, which was in the Montgomery becomes Atlanta Highway, you can almost go, okay, here are the 20s, here are the 30s. Okay, yeah. here's, mm -hmm. here's the, really the, the post-war, late 40s, early 50s. Okay, once you get around like the... Forest, uh, forest hills, and and you keep moving out. Okay, here are the sixties, and as you get kind of out toward the the mall, okay, seventies, eighties, and now you know nineties, yeah. two thousands, yeah. all the way. So you can you can literally drive and see the decades. <laughs> now I can imagine by the seventies when, because I, I downtown I think was in, in beginning to in terms of retail was more in decline really really in the 80s so there yeah. was still there was, so the decline of that the uh, neighborhood at that time in the 70s I can see you know it's in those middle years 
You, you didn't see the like as we see now, and I think that's in part probably why the equal justice was able to be put in that neighborhood because a lot of it had been cleared again for when they put the interstate through. Yeah. After the interstate was put through the buildings that because it's very close to the interstate still, you mm -hmm. know, then they were going to transform it maybe to more industrial property and it just kind of laid there. So I I guess the. The, the silver lining of it is that you do have the Equal Justice Memorial there, and it is sizable. I mean, if if visitors to Montgomery come, we do recommend they go see it because you you kind of get a two for one <laughs> in, yes. in the neighborhood. You can you can see the Scott and Zelda area, but also yeah. the Equal Justice. And there are many 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 streets in the, in the Cottage Hill uh, area. I'm thinking particularly of a street I love called Martha Street, which it's beautiful it's 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 beautiful beyond description i mean montgomery to me is a very beautiful city i don't and the cottage hill uh, district needs to come back i think so i think that the resolve is there and that we hope you enjoyed it um hopefully when things calm down we will be able to not have so many distractions and technical <laughs> issues and thank you to everyone that's reached out. And if you have any requests for future episodes, please email us. Or any, anything else? No, I think we've done it all. All right. Well, thank you for bearing with us, and I uh, hope to see you next time.